I wrote a very complicated homily for you about the philosophical anthropology of Pope John Paul II because the reading from Genesis today was one of Pope John Paul's favourite bits of the Bible and he spent two years preaching about it at his Wednesday morning audiences. But I came into the chapel last night and read through the scripture readings again and it struck me with real force that each one of them is about God's love for us touching our lives in different ways and that this was maybe a better theme for the beginning of the year than existential solitude although they are connected and we'll touch on it just a tiny bit because in the first reading Adam is walking in the Garden of Eden at the very dawn of creation he's like the first year undergraduate at Freshers Fair winding through the stalls it's a world of infinite possibility but the nearer he gets to the end the more he worries that his deepest needs for friendship and love might not be found <coughs> Adam is alone the important thing to realize however is that God notices his loneliness there is a real tenderness here God comes to Adam's side he shows him all the wild beasts and all the birds of heaven hoping that something will satisfy him and when nothing is quite right he forms Eve from Adam's side and presents her to Adam who leaps with delight and says this at last is bone of my bone and flesh from my flesh now this is clearly a story about the meaning of marriage and the love of man and woman and its origins but it's also more widely this was one of John Paul II's points it's also about the human condition about you and me each one of us is longing for friendship and love and God is at our side very close to us he knows what is in our hearts he's working in our lives maybe in very hidden ways but leading us forward inviting us into friendship with him and with those around us so when you meet someone this week being really concrete with you this week today tomorrow this week anyone at all think of it as a biblical encounter you're in a lecture theatre you're in your hall of residence you're in the street believe that this random meeting between you and another person is as astonishing as that first encounter between Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden if only you could recognize it this is the miracle that we can connect with another person heart to heart however different we are as long as we do have a heart that is open as Adam's heart was open as long as our words are truthful and kind and sincere and life-giving now be careful I'm not saying that when you're in the queue at McDonald's you turn around to the stranger behind you and say you at last are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh because this might freak them out slightly yeah? but it is actually true and you should actually long to say that to them we are one body one flesh one family the second reading from the letter to the Hebrews shows how far God will go to show this love that he revealed to Adam the heart of Christianity which sets it apart from every other religion is our belief in the incarnation that God has sent his son to share our humanity 
He takes on not just our human nature at Christmas, but also our human condition. Meaning he enters into the depths and the reality of the human situation, of every human situation, so that no one ever can say that God is not with them. And nothing anywhere can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. As the letter to the Hebrews says in a curious phrase, I'm quoting, the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are from the same line. They are of the same nature. Jesus, the Holy One, is one with us. This changes things. It's not just theory. Whatever you're experiencing this week, you know that Christ is with you. Sometimes it helps to do something very simple to remember this, like don't do this now, um, well you can if you like, but maybe do this at home when you're praying tonight. Just something very simple like sitting down, closing your eyes and imagining that Christ is sitting next to you and sitting with him, waiting with him, talking to him in your prayer. This isn't a fantasy, it's an imaginative insight into a deeper, truer reality that he is with us, he is present with us. And this knowledge gives us a peace and a reassurance even if on the surface we're worried or distracted. It gives us the confidence to pray because we know he's listening to us. It gives us the courage to do brave things, good things, because we know he's looking after us, he's fighting for us. And the Gospel reading, in that last section we heard, is about the danger of restricting this amazing love and closing our hearts to others. The disciples see people bringing children to Jesus and they turn them away. Remember that in the ancient Near East in the time of Jesus, children do not represent innocence and purity and sweetness like they do in modern Western culture. Children occupy the very lowest status in society. So when Jesus sees the disciples turning them away and he rebukes the disciples, his response is, is very symbolic. You must not stop the children coming to me. Or put it another way, my kingdom belongs to them, to the children, to the unwanted, to the outsiders, to the forgotten, to the powerless, as much as anyone else as much as it does to you disciples. And in fact the very point of this kingdom, of God's kingdom, is that it has no boundaries. God's love has no limits. He is the good shepherd who leaves the safety, the boundaries of the farm, and goes into the mountains, into the wilderness, in order to find the lost sheep. Our love is meant to be that generous and we must be very very careful especially at the beginning of an academic year that we don't act like the disciples and start filtering people into those we speak to and those we don't those who are part of my in crowd and those who are outside it in God's kingdom everyone is already inside and the question is, do we want to be inside with them and with God or not? And finally, a slightly extra appendix here. But just after Mass, we're going to give you a goodie bag. I thought you might cheer or something, yes? <laughs> we, don't, we don't often give you something free. But it's actually to help you to understand the mission of Jesus in the Gospel today. There are three gifts in this bag. 
First, a copy of the Magnificat. It's a beautiful book of prayers and scripture readings. This is for you personally. Please use it and treasure it. Second, in your bag, there are 20 yellow postcards and four pink posters to advertise the chaplaincy, but more than that, to help students know that there is a place at university, in their college, in their cath socks, where they can live and explore their faith. Last year when we did this, I got told off after the Mass by one of the students, she's sitting here today, who was a sub-warden in her UCL Hall of Residence. Apparently I had asked the students to do illegal things, like putting the postcards under doors and pinning the posters onto public notice boards. Maybe the postcards on the floor are a trip hazard, I don't know. Anyway, I apologise to this student, very sincerely. So this year, I'm asking you to do absolutely everything possible on this side of legality. <laughs> right? If it is legal, put the postcards under the doors of your neighbour. If it's legal, leave them in the lobby. Keep them in your bag, a few of them, and give them to friends. Give them to strangers. You might think it's mad, but it works. If it's legal, put the posters up in your hall, in your college, and especially, because this is a place we often don't get to, in your academic department or department college common room. These sound like small things, but this is a really important mission. So many students and staff feel they are alone in their faith at university. It breaks my heart to discover at the end of the year that someone had no idea there was a community of faith here at the chaplaincy and in their college cath socks. The small things you can do to help publicise the chaplaincy can have a huge and life-changing effect on others. So thank you for your help.